Okay, so let's begin about fluid and electrolyte management in newborn. Friends, you and I know that uh, fluid and electrolytes remain to be most important in newborn care simply because which fluid to give, when to give, when not to give, and how much to give are the daily in and out questions in an NICU. So we need to answer all of them thoroughly. Fine. First of all, let us understand what are the basic compartments of the fluids in the body. Body is made up of cell. So, the fluid which is there within the cell is known as intracellular fluid. Then there are two other things, vessel and the interstitium. So, fluid which is there in the interstitium and vessel together which is outside the cell. Hence, it is known as extracellular fluid. So, fluid in the interstitium that is your interstitial fluid and fluid in the vessel that is your intravascular fluid. Both together are known as extracellular fluid. Revise it once again. Fluid within the cell is intracellular fluid. Fluid within interstitium and vessel is known as extracellular fluid. There is no confusion here, okay? Fine. Let us understand what happens to this fluid compartments throughout the journey from fetus to the newborn and adult life. So, what happens to the total body water and the extracellular water is shown here by the graph. You and I know that the journey of life begins with few cells and that increases to the complex organ system and then finally, you become more and more complex system. So, the in utero life or the fetal life will be much more fluidity, much more water. So, the fluid will be almost 90 percent that reduces to almost 75 percent at birth and that keeps on gradually reducing, reducing and reducing. The fetus which is there inside is more of hollow viscous. Say for example, stomach dilated full, it is not containing much of the thin. The lining of that is also very thin and small. So, and there is no fat deposition much in the fetus. As the progress occurs in utero and then ex utero life, the fat also gets deposit. More and more complex organ system develops. So, cell line also increases. Okay. So, there is development other than the fluid. Okay. So, there is the reduction in the fluid and hence the intracellular fluid starts keep on rising from fetus to the newborn life and that takes on its toll. Okay. Is it clear now for both the things? Okay. So, let us see what happens before the delivery and during the labor. This is the very familiar diagram which we have taken up in the first slide. Under the effect of the stress hormones during the last uh, stage of delivery or before the labor, the fluid from the intravascular compartment enters into the interstitium. That makes the interstitial compartment a little bit huge, little bit big. This will conserve the water for first two days. After the delivery, again under the effect of hormones and other changes in the milieu, this water which was there in the interstitium comes back to the intravascular compartment once again. And this is really important phenomenon. Why? Because the under the effect of the stress hormone, the water has entered the interstitial compartment. For first 48 hours, you and I both know that the intake of the water in form of milk or mother's milk will be lesser. So, in first 48 hours, this particular water is going to salvage the newborn and gradually under the effect of the changes, the interstitial fluid comes back to the intravascular compartment and that is also seen as diuresis. Okay. So, this is to keep you alive, answer this question, why newborn or preterm babies have larger amount of water than older infants. Okay. So, this was something what uh, you can look at. The left hand side there are gestational uh, weeks which is given and the other parameters have been side by side laid down. If we look at this first parameter on the right side, the body fat gradually keeps on mounting as the gestation increases. We have already discussed that the cells keep on lining, the cell line matures and complex organ systems develop and the uh, cuffing of these cell lines and other things will be by fat. So, that uh, 
fat also increases as the fat increases as the cell line increases the water tends to reduce so whatever was there whatever was the there in this particular area say for example total body water was 85 to 90 percent in the 24 to 27 week gestation as compared to the term gestation where your body water percentage is only 71 to 76 and that's why these babies who are newborn or a preterm even will have larger amount of water compared to their other counterparts clear that takes to the another question why preterm babies tend to lose more weight than term babies the answer is same within the uh, things what i have displayed Rubber. here we are having the 24 to 27 weaker who is having 85 to 90 percent of body water while the term baby is having 70 percent of water now this water is going to be lost in terms of insensible water loss and insensible water loss will lead to what a weight loss also we know that the term baby loses 5 to 10 percent of weight in first week of life while the preterm can lose 10 to 20 percent why preterm is more simply because they are having more water so they tend to lose more water again their body defense is against losing the water like skin barrier and other things are also supportive in this and that's why they lose more water that's what we are going to look at in the further slides now the question arises is where does the water go okay we know that the water is lost but where does it lost so it can be lost either by a sensible losses meaning that it is measurable what are the examples of a sensible water loss okay so the examples will be urine stool either diarrhea or if you have gone uh, through a colostomy then stomy bags might be uh, telling you the amount of water lost in a stool nasogastric or orogastric drainages these are all the examples of sensible water loss okay and there is another thing what is known as insensible water loss this is unmeasurable what are the examples the water which you lose through the skin and through the respiratory mucosa why this is important the insensible water loss is really important it is very key variable why simply because the skin and the respiratory mucosa whatever you are losing is almost two-third of your total water loss so that is really important while planning a fluid prescription for the newborn or any infant okay how does it vary insensible water loss is inversely related to gestational age the lower the gestational age more the water loss postnatal age higher the postnatal age lesser the water loss this is because skin thickens with the age and the older is better then body surface area to weight ratio is also important fine so these are the key variables for insensible water loss and insensible water loss in turn is also a great great important factor for preventing the water loss in the newborn so or managing the fluid and electrolytes finer balance is again always dependent on insensible water loss what is the role of stratum corneum or the upper layer of the skin here is your stratum corneum what is stratum corneum it's an outermost part of the skin the outermost layer of the skin the interesting phenomenon of this particular thing is that stratum corneum is often 10 to 20 layers in full term infants in adults it's often 20 layers okay but when you get a baby who is preterm say for example 30 weaker your stratum corneum is mere of one or two layers only and this will be virtually absent if you are dealing with a baby who is 24 weaker that means your skin is almost transparent if you are a 24 weaker anything and everything can exit from that particular skin because there is a very thin barrier of stratum corneum so let us see what increases the insensible water loss insensible water loss means water loss through 
respiratory mucosa and skin. So, if the baby is tachypneic, his respiratory rate is high, he tend to lose more because through respiratory mucosa you are losing much more. Under the radiant warmer and phototherapy, you are losing more than 50 percent. How? Because it increases the ambient temperature and baby tends to lose it through skin. Again, if the environmental temperature is high, you can have increase in the insensible water loss by 30 percent. If you have a breached skin, your skin is protection against the insensible water loss, but if it is breached, say for example, you have removed the adhesive tape very bluntly, so the upper epithelial layers have gone, so that is going to create a problem. Surgical malformations like gastrocystis, omphalocele, neural tube defects, they are all going to create problem because they are open defects, mucosa is directly in contact of air. Body temperature rise, if the baby is feeling fever, naturally you are going to lose much more fluid. If the ambient humidity is down, hot and humid day, then you are having to lose much and more insensible water loss. If the motor activity is also increased, the baby is crying and cranky throughout, then again you are having too much of water loss. Similar is true for the baby who is convulsing a lot, okay. So this is all about how, uh, what are the factors which increases the insensible water loss. The question is why to prevent insensible water loss? We are talking so much of insensible water loss, the million dollar question is why to prevent insensible water loss, okay. Let us see what happens. Well, at the time what happens that if the insensible water loss keep on occurring, the intravascular and extracellular fluid is going to reduce gradually, okay. And that reduction is going to produce what? It is going to increase the viscosity of the fluid which is there in the intravascular compartment. So naturally the electrolytes which were been dissolved in plasma yet now comes to the higher concentration, a relative higher concentration because water is lost. So thus there is an insensible water loss that leads to increase in the sodium like electrolyte content which is relatively now high. So there is relative hypernatremic situation in patients with high degree of insensible water loss. What thus leads to? A high viscosity, blood is not able to flow easily through the small capillaries, through the small vessels and that tends to increase problems of ischemia and other things throughout the body and that leads to acidosis, uremia and shock. So if a poor chap who is just 24 weaker having a high insensible water loss which is not recognized, not treated, lands up usually with uremia, acidosis or shock. And we want to prevent it, if we want to prevent it, we need to take control of this insensible water loss. Is it clear? Okay. That is why it is very important. So the next question comes is how to reduce insensible water loss. We all nowadays treat the babies under radiant warmer. We feel very safe, we are easy, uh, finding it easy to monitor because the babies are in open environment. But what happens? that this leads to a lot of insensible water loss. Let us protect it, let us shield it, okay. How can we do it? We can do it either by nursing these babies and incubator, especially the double walled incubator. These double walled incubator are going to salvage this insensible water loss because they are having a good covering throughout. But you and I know that we stay in a country which is resource limited, we cannot afford every time or an NICU cannot have every baby under the incubator. So what else can be done, okay? What else can be done? You can do this simple little technology which is known as clings wrap which is nothing but a good food grade clean plastic wrapped over the baby so it covers most part of the baby over the radiant warmer. That tends to protect this baby's insensible water loss by 30 to 50 percent. Research is going on on this particular aspect, but it is proven that this reduces insensible water loss. So all centers who is not having incubator services can utilize this particular thing for 
salvaging the babies. So these are the two measures what we can utilize for them. Now look at this typical baby, day in and out situation, PICU, NICU, you get these babies. Let us count how many sticking plasters been wrapped around them. Number one, you get a plaster for a tube which is endotracheal. You get a plaster for the IV line or the central venous line. You get a plaster for fixation of a probe or the uh, intravascular catheter and you get a probe fixed on his skin. So There are a lot of sticking material. You will say this is required because monitoring is required, you require an intravascular fluid therapy, everything, agreed. But what happens when you remove them? This, this or this and these are all detrimental simply because it is almost removing the uppermost layer of the skin and that is really detrimental because we know that insensible water loss increases if your skin is breached. So be gentle, do not use the adhesives if not required and when you remove be ultra gentle. Okay. So that is the point you need to remember. So how to reduce that injury? You have to use a non abrasive taps like Micropore. I would like to clarify that uh, I have no funding interest or any competitive interest with the company but just an example is set. Then you can use other uh, things which are also available in this market. Then semi permeable membranes beneath these taps lead to really improvement and they need to be focused upon. Many a times you can use uh, soft paraffin or emollient uh, ointments to prevent the uh, what you can say removal of ep upper epithelium. Then the other compartment is respiratory mucosa. So how to reduce the insensible water loss through respiratory mucosa? That can be very well done if you use a humidified inspired gases or oxygen while giving through the hat box and ventilator. For that you have to constantly monitor that your chamber is really well filled. Here one part is always remaining that we tend to humidify our oxygen but we do not warmidify them. So the modern blenders which give you a good warmidification and humidification they are the best source. Here only humidification is going on, warmidification is not going on. So if we can achieve both of them that will be really good. That can be uh, seen with the chambers which are used for the ventilation. Okay. So summarizing them all, we will use incubators if required, especially for the smaller preterm babies, wherever it is possible. If it is not possible, we can use thin transparent plastic barriers like Kling's wrap. We can use plexiguard heat shields. We can use the humidifications of gas for preventing it through respiratory mucosal loss. Then we can prevent the skin injury, very important and we must address that. We can apply oil and ointment to prevent skin injuries and that will also be a barrier for preventing the insensible water loss. So the question is, whatever you are losing, you need to put it back, simple rule. So how much to put back? Well, first of all, you have to take into account the replacement of loss and growth. What are we losing? Insensible water loss and sensible water loss. Add to this the fluid which is required for the growth. If there are new cells generating, if there are new organs developing, you need to give water for that part also. So that is the water which is required for growth. So that needs to be put back. But something needs to be deducted from this. What needs to be deducted? Something which is given just like that. For example, we have transfused a baby or given a IV push, a normal saline bolus of 10 ml per kilo and we have forgotten that. Okay. So that needs to be cut down from whatever we are putting back into the baby. And something like water is generated through endogenous project, uh, production. Say for example, a carbon, uh, I mean carbohydrate is getting uh, digested and metabolized some chemical reaction will generate H2O and that is your endogenous water. So that needs to be deducted from whatever you are putting back to this particular situation. So that takes you to some kind of an arbitrary formula which is used in most of the NICU 
that if you are on day 1 with less than 1 kg, 1 to 1.5 kg and more than 1.5 kg, 60, 80 and 80 to 100 are usually the volume of uh, per kg been used. Again the first question arises is why less than 1 kg is having 80 to 100 ml per kg submission or requirement and uh, more than 1.5 kg is requiring only 60 ml. Can you answer that? If you are losing more, you are needing more. That is how the 1 kg baby is having requirement of 80 to 100 compared to more than 1.5 kg of 60. So, as the day progresses, every time the day progresses, say for example, on day 2 or 3, you are going to increase this particular uh, volume 15 to 20 ml per kilo. You will be increasing to 80, 100 and 120 on day 2 or 3. Again same formula applies for day 4 and 5. Again same formula applies for day 6 and day 7. On 7th day, everybody is equalized to 150 ml per kilo. Why? A journey which became with a difference comes to the equality on 7th day. Why? Absolutely right. So, what happens to this baby at 1 week of age is nothing but your stratum corneum matures enough to handle the water and that is why at the end of 7th day, your baby who is preterm or term is equal. So, let us see what happens and the basic principle of a fluid prescription. First of all, you have to take birth weight into account till baby grows beyond. Say for example, a baby who has started the journey at 1.5 kg birth weight and you are writing a fluid prescription on his 20th day, if he has crossed to one point from 1.5 to 1.7, you might prescribe now his today's daily requirement. Why? With the weight of 1.7 into the required fluid, clear? While if the baby is not doing good, say for example on the 7th day and his weight is 1.35 from 1.5, which weight you will utilize? 1.5, ok. So, fluid will be counted on basis of 1.5 and not the 1.35 which is reduced weight, ok. We have to add extra for the conditions which increases insensible or sensible loss. For example, 20 ml per kilo is usually said to be increased if a baby is treated under radiant warmer or phototherapy. Now, this needs to be taken with a word of or a pinch of salt or word of caution has to be addressed here. Why? Because nowadays, for example, especially for the phototherapy, if your baby is under phototherapy, say older time was we are using tube light phototherapy, a very high temperature generation was going on. Then came CFL which was little lesser than the tube light phototherapy and now we are using LED phototherapy which is not generating too much of heat. In fact, it is known as a cool light. So, whatever you are uh, using will not be losing too much of uh, insensible water loss. So, that is why this needs to be taken with a pinch of salt. You might uh, take your own policy for your unit that if an LED is getting used, we might increase 5 to 10 or we might not increase at all and we will keep on monitoring this baby well. It is unit to unit choice and your own policy need to be decided, ok. Final total volume calculated for 24 hours and that prescription will not be sticking forever. It needs to be revised every 4 to 6 hours. This is a T20 match, not a test match. The policy keeps on rolling in all newborns. So, you have to monitor every 6 hourly your fluid therapy. Let us take it by an example. So, first of all, we need to take into account a birth weight of the baby. For example, we are taking an example of 3 kg baby weight on day 7. So, on 7th day we know that 150 ml per kilo of the body we have to use as a basic fluid volume. So, 150 into 3 takes to 450 ml of water. Then you have to add the losses, sensible losses and insensible losses. Already insensible losses have been taken into account when we are multiplying the body weight to the basic fluid volume. 
because basic fluid volume has come from the calculations of insensible water losses. So, if a baby is under warmer, here we will be adding 20 ml per kilo of extra fluid. So, that will be 20 ml into 3 that is 60 ml. So, 450 plus 60 will take to 510 ml. Then you have to deduct the others. For example, blood or blood products, IV pushes, injection dilutions. For example, this baby had a vancomycin injection going on, which is you and I know to be dissolved in 30 ml of normal saline minimum to run over a half an hour or so. So, that 90 ml of uh, normal saline needs to be taken into consideration and this particular baby might be receiving it 8 hourly. So, 30, 30 and 30 total 90 ml of normal saline came into picture that has to be minus from this 510 total. So, that comes to 420 and that gives you actual volume. Now, this actual volume whatever was there that is 420 ml to be divided for this baby from which route you are going to give this water. If you are going to give it through IV that will be going separate. If you are going to give it through oral that will be going separate. So, this actual volume need to be decided and then that to be divided. Now, if it is going for a, a oral say for example, I am giving this baby a 20 ml per uh, kilo of a Ryle's tube feeding or an infant feeding. Then what will happen? That 20 ml per kilo means 60 ml of this particular baby will be deducted from 420 and that for uh, that will come to 360. So, 360 will be going as IV fluid on 24 hour basis and 60 ml will be going for the infant feeding. Okay. So, we will divide accordingly. Very important statement is this that there is a two school of thought, but most neonatal units and everybody in uh, including me agree to this that most of us should use a restricted versus liberal water intake. Why? This beautiful study from Cochrane library says that restriction of water intake so as the physiological needs to be met with without significant dehydration is expected to decrease the risk of PDA, NEC without significantly increasing the risk of adverse reaction. Means, if you are on drier side, if you are on little lesser side, then you are going to have much more better outcome. Your baby might not suffer with your PDA or NEC and that is going to help you out in a long run. So, if you want to improve the outcome of a preterm baby, ELBW baby or a VLBW baby, the better that you are on the lesser side. And this takes us to the salt and curry story. What is that? Well, I call it curry and salt story simply because suppose you are making a curry and if you have added an extra salt to this curry, how can you remove it? Or how can you make the curry again back to look uh, same tastier as it was? Dilution will hamper the uh, nutritional health value and other things. Okay. The point here is that if you have added extra salt, there is no remedy for that. It is very difficult and you lose nutrition and many things. But suppose if I have added less salt to the curry, do I have a chance to improve it further? Yes, I can add salt always and make my curry look more tastier. The same principle applies to the fluid prescription of a newborn. If you have added too much there is no chance, there is no way back. But if you added less and baby is on little drier side, you can always improve upon. Clear? So, the message from the curry and salt story is, do not add too much of water to this baby. They are tiny little and it is difficult to manage them later. Clear? So, again revising that uh, principles, you have to take into account the birth weight and day of life and based upon the day of life and the equation, you have to take up the total volume that is by basic fluid plus insensible water loss plus sensible water loss minus the uh, fluid used for dilution of the drugs, IV pushes, blood products and other things and that takes you to the actual volume. Now, this actual volume to be divided into various subheads like which one to be given by IV fluids and which uh, how much volume to be given through the oral feeds. 
that has to be decided. So that takes you an account of ml per hour. So this is again the same thing what we have uh, seen, I am not going into detail, but later part we can also see here. Then one need to remember that this is a day in and day out situation, this is an every ball game, means every hour the situation might change in that particular newborn, a preterm the course might not be same throughout the 24 hours, he might develop some problems later, so you have to keep on changing. If he develops a watery diarrhea, you might have to give him an ongoing loss support also, beyond the maintenance fluid. If he is having intestinal obstruction, you might have to add the aspirates and drains also. If he is having NEC, your fluid requirement might go up also. If he is having PDA, you might restrict the fluid instead of liberal uh, free fluids. If he is having acute renal failure, again you are going to restrict the fluid to 400 ml per meter square or 40 ml per kg, whatever is your unit policies. If he is having a chronic lung disease, again you are going to restrict. So there is no typical cookbook formula for a particular thing that you can go always by this recipe. No, it is a every day, every minute changing equations, you have to keep into a line. How to bring accuracy in prescription? This is also very important because most of the fluid and electrolyte mishaps occur because of a faulty prescription. How does this faulty prescription occur? Because if you are not writing neatly, my request to you is to use printer and computers if possible. You can use calculators so that your uh, uh, busy nights might produce good results. Okay, You are not in a good state, you are busy with something, your mind is preoccupied and your calculations which are done manually might go wrong, but not the machines. So use calculators if possible. You have to show all the steps of counting because if your uh, other colleague wants to recheck it, he can only recheck if all the steps are been uh, said to be. So do not do some steps in your mind only, write it down on the paper also. You have to double check the situation because somebody's life is pending upon your prescription. You have to see for the fluid rate always in ml per hour, not in mg per kg per minute like what you drove for other drugs. Okay, That is going to create uh, confusion in minds of people who are caregiver like nurses and other things. Fluid orders to be designed for small intervals, not for say next 7 days, not for next 24 hours, but for 6 hours to 12 hours maximum. Clear? And you have to keep on reviewing the situation. But friends, this makes me almost insane, how much to do and how much not to do. So, but I am very fond, not fond of calculation also, we all are lovers of biology, but not the mathematics. So we will find it little tough. But do not worry, if you are a tax savvy, the answers are in front of you. There are many websites, there are many applications and mobile applications and other things available on Google Play stores or the Apple store. You can download whatever you require. So there are things available, you can always download them. There are easy calculators available, you can download, you can use. Say you want to give a do uh, dopamine drip, there is easy calculation available. You want to give a glucose infusion rate to be decided, there is a calculator available on net, so everything is available, please use them, choose your way, but be perfect in your prescription. Suppose if you are uh, passing through a prescription, okay, but then the delivering this particular fluid to the baby is also a tricky situation and if possible, you want to give it more accurately, then you should use Importantly, the instruments like syringe pump, infusion pump, which can give a better uh, precise volume to the baby. Proper input and output nursing chart is very important. And suppose if you are not having anything, you are working in a peripheral setup, you are working in a resource limited setup, and you are just having a pediatric infusion set with you, how to give? fluid, say for example, I want to give 10 ml per kilo per hour fluid to this baby, then how to give it pediatric drip set? It is already written here that you have to set that much micro drops per minute, say for example, 10 ml per hour, then I will set 10 drops or 10 micro drops per minute 
into pediatric infusion set and that will give me the 10 ml per hour rate. Monitoring the fluid therapy is also very important. How can you do it? By measuring a daily weight. Sometimes you have to do it measurement every 6 hourly or 12 hourly based upon how labile the situation of the fluid and electrolyte in that particular baby. Urine output, very good measurement of a sensible water loss. Other drain output like NG tube drain or a peritoneal drain or any other drain which has been kept into that baby. Vitals, blood pressure often shows a signs of dehydration but it is a very late sign. Okay, Unless you have lost 25% or more of fluid, this sign is not going to come into play. But yes, for all measures you have to look at blood pressures. Labs play a vital role here. Urine specific gravity, if your specific gravity of urine is increasing, that means you are losing, uh, producing a concentrated urine, that means you are dehydrating. Same way urinary sodium, serum sodium and fractional acceleration of sodium are also vital parameters to be utilized for looking at the particularly what kind of fluid status the baby is having. Electrolyte prescriptions, for first day or two, you have to use 10% dextrose. In cases of VLBW or ELBW, many units prefer to use 5% dextrose instead of 10%. So, that varies according to, but 5% dextrose is definitely a better choice for VLBW or ELBW babies. If they are not going to develop hypoglycemia, of course, you are monitoring them. The day 3 onwards, your electrolyte should be added now. So, sodium of 3 milliequivalent per kg, 2 to 3 milliequivalent per kg per day, potassium of 2 to 3 milliequivalent, preferably 2 milliequivalent per kg per day. But when you are uh, adding this electrolyte, especially potassium, you have to make sure that the urine output is well established. The pediatric uh, maintenance fluid often choiced afterwards is 5 to 10 percent of dextrose in 1 sixth normal saline. Okay. You might ask me what is that? The trade name or trade formula what is used is isolate P. This is a chart available or of the common uh, commercially available fluid and their uh, sodium content. The fluid which is usually used as a maintenance fluid for the newborn is isolate P or the dextrose 5 or 10 percent in 1 6 normal saline. That is 1 6 simply because your normal saline contains 154 sodium. So, this maintenance fluid which is having 25 is called 1 6 normal saline of this particular thing. So, this is uh, in short the summary of the parental fluids available and used in NICU. Some of the electrolyte disturbance, we are not going into detail because they are subject on, is on their own, but little bit of tips on them. Common problem, hyponatremia. Why do that occur? Due to excessive water loss, commonly because of the insensible water loss in summer, especially in tropical countries like India, this is by far the most commonest problem that babies come hyponatremic dehydration with fever and not feeding well and all other problems in summer months very commonly. This is often associated with inadequate feeding, mother is primary, not knowing how to feed the adjustment problems and all other things lead to problem. Many a times babies who are under radiant warmer and there is a high ambient temperature, they also tend to develop hyponatremic dehydration. If the babies are having open body defects, again insensible water loss increases and that leads to hypernatremia. We know that if the water loss is increased, relative hypernatremia is always going to be generated. And sensible water loss like in extreme premature babies or babies who are developing diarrhea, Typical uh, photograph of that hypernatremic dehydration, you and I both see day in and day out in our country. Very rarely, but it could be possible that there could be a excess of sodium added to that baby that leads to hypernatremic dehydration. A rare, but a possible situation could be a breast milk hypernatremia in some mothers. So, you can always look at the uh, breast milk sodium concentration and based upon that you can judge this situation. 
then if you are using a soda bicarb in excess, if you are using some other drug formulas or if you are not properly giving a dispension for the diarrhea, for example, ORS is given but the proper dilution is not made, then hypernatremic dehydration can occur in patient. The treatment for this hypernatremic dehydration remains under three pivots. You have to replace the free water deficit, you have to do a slow correction of the sodium by 0.5 milli equivalent per kg per day and you have to maintain the serum sodium states very well. The fluid of choice here could be dextrose normal saline, normal saline, dextrose 5 percent uh, with half normal saline based upon the sodium and the glucose levels. Okay. So, that has to be taken into account. The another situation is hyponatremia. Why do hyponatremia occur in babies? Diuretics, glycosuria, renal water handling is problematic in VLBW babies, adrenal and renal tubular disorders, GI losses, third space losses and many other things. The most common problem of hyponatremia which you and I encounter in NICU is syndrome of inappropriate secretion of antidiuretic hormone or shortly or commonly known as SIADH. That is the very big problem what most babies under stress develop. So, treating the acute phase of hyponatremia is very important. If your baby is in less than 125 sodium, you have to treat it with 3 percent of normal saline that is specially available, 4 ml per kilo of those to be given. Once your baby is stabilized to 125 plus of sodium, but not to the 135 or more than 130, then you can restrict the fluid to 2 third or 3 fourth in SIDH like situation. Hyperkalemia is another thing what uh, we commonly encounter, commonly seen with the renal failure patients or non oliguric hyperkalemia can also be seen in ELBW babies. Acidosis situations, congenital adrenal hyperplasia can also present with hyperkalemia uh, and hyponatremia. So, that is a uh, known situation and depending upon your potassium levels, the different changes on ECG can be seen. Many a times the lab values vary a lot and uh, there is often a clinical correlation difficult with these patients potassium levels. So, best would be your uh, ECG or EKG findings which will guide you what to do next. The treatment for hyperkalemia based upon three basic pivots. First is membrane stabilization, you can use IV calcium 1 to 2 cc that will prevent the arrhythmias at the cardiac level and that is going to help you. Then internal redistribution can be done uh, by means of IV insulin, glucose drip, soda bicarbonate or using a beta adrenergic agonist like salbutamol, this can be used by means of nebulization or inhalation. And you can also eliminate them higher by using uh, something like your uh, K-exalates or a loop diuretic like uh, fruzamide, peritoneal dialysis and exchange transfusion can also be helpful, but treating the cause here remains to be the most important fact. For example, if your baby is having hyperkalemia secondary to renal failure, the peritoneal dialysis is often a preferred choice while the baby is gradually improving. Okay. So, based upon the requirement, you can choose your treatment policy. So, friends, that is all about fluid and electrolytes. You can share your views and do not forget to subscribe us on YouTube and other channels for easy pediatrics. Thank you.